Welcome, my friends, to our lectionary podcast for this Pentecost Sunday in which we are addressing Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. We have a nice chunk of text in front of us, but the good news is that those dark days of no Old Testament reading are a last over, and we can get back to this richness that we've been ignoring during the Easter season. That said, and yes, that grousing aside, uh, this text is fraught with all kinds of interesting issues. Things to consider as we begin our discussion is first, what to do with the dry bones? Uh, this is a text we all kind of know. I won't break out into them bones, them bones, them dry bones. I will spare you that horrible singing. But the issues come into play, namely, what is this talking about? Is it a national resurrection, a re restoration of the community, or is it some sort of revivication, resurrection of the dead? Those are the two basic interpretive issues. And along those lines, this is a passage that is all about the Ruach, all about the Spirit. Hebrew itself, thankfully, compared to other texts, is as simple as it comes, uh, basic prose. But within this, and the other thing to consider, is that Ezekiel here uses multiple leetvorts, multiple keywords, repeat, repeated themes over and over again. So pay attention with me, especially every time we see the word ruach, the word for spirit. Uh, that said, without further ado, let's jump into this wonderfully rich text that starts out with Ezekiel 37, beginning with verse 1. And here it actually isn't all that uh, difficult. You'll note that you have a Hayata. Uh, what makes this sort of interesting is you'd be typically expecting a preterite to start a prose section. Here it's a perfect. But now note what happens. The Yad Yahweh was upon me. A uh, hand of the Lord. Get excited when you see that. When you see Yad or arm, that's referring to God's saving action. So already with Yad, be expecting this to be some sort of salvific text. And now what happens? Vayotzini, and he led me in the Ruach. So now, Ruach, I told you to keep score at home. This is, according to my math, uh, the first one. This you know is a Hiffel, and how do you know it's a Hiffel? Because as a first yod, the yod becomes a vav plus the interior dot vel. Uh, yotzi tend to get excited about it because it's a basic Exodus word. And he brought me in the spirit of Yahweh, and he caused me to rest. Another hiffel of nuach. You'd expect that interior here at yod tells you it's a hiffel. And he brought me in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. Again, relatively straightforward, but the etzamot, the bones are going to be everything here. And it gets worse. Hiffel of Avar here, and he caused me to pass upon them. Uh, and this expression is onomatopoetic. Saviv, saviv, around and around. You only need really one here. Instead, we get two for the price of one. But it's the round and around vahene, behold, attention-getting particle. It was uh, full of many bones upon the face of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. Uh, if you recall Ezekiel's theology, this is already pretty, pretty significant. Ezekiel, more so than any of the other prophets, is very priestly in his orientation. And here... A couple things have happened. Uh, one, he's dealing with dead body contamination, which, if you recall, is generally bad news for a priest. Although Ezekiel 4, he's already eaten uh, meals cooked on dung, so he's been on a bit of a bad roll for, most of the, for frankly, most of the book. Uh, that said, he is in a ritually unclean state here, which makes it even, even more shocking. And it gets worse. A uh, note the way that, it's a, that he goes around and around, he cannot escape, and their dryness and their scatteredness. Uh, this isn't a typical image for how you'd expect burial to happen. 
It said the image that we're given here is the image of war dead that have been catastrophically clobbered, killed, and otherwise slaughtered and mangled and left to rot without being given a proper burial, which is bad news. It gets better. Uh, by Yomer Eli Ben Adam, and he said to me, son of man, uh, Ben Adam, don't get super excited here. Uh, ben Adam in Ezekiel is not the Ben Adam in Daniel. Uh, this is Ezekiel's classic self-designation of person, human one. It emphasizes the Adaminess, if you will, of Ezekiel. He's a human as opposed to God. And now interrogative, hey, can these bones live? What a silly question to ask. Already we have the shocking nature here. And he asks him a simple question. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel here is properly deferential. Va'omar Adonai Yahweh Ata Yadata. And I said, Lord Yahweh, note Lord here. Lord here emphasizes the opposite of Adam. Lord Yahweh, Master Yahweh. You yourself know. Note the redundant, redundant pronoun here. You yourself know. Uh, this isn't like one of my students duck, ducking a question in class. This is actually Ezekiel being properly deferential. He doesn't know the right answer. He's in a horribly nasty spot. And he does the only thing he can do, which is simply to defer to Yahweh. To defer to Yahweh to come up with the answer. Uh, that said, let's keep going on. Because this text gets even uglier and deeper. So now we move down to verse 4. Doing the miracles of wonder, wonder, wonderful technology, excellently overshooting the mark. Bomar Eli, Eli, and he said to me, Hanabe, a halatzmot, ha'ela, prophesy upon these bones. Note, you know that's a niffle, why? Because you have a triangle of recognition points, Herrick doubling comets. That tells you it's a niffal. The hay tells you it's a niffal imperative. Uh, don't get super excited. Uh, Nava only appears in the niffal. So uh, nothing super noteworthy other than being able to show you geometry, talking about Hebrew, which just makes me nervous. And he said to me, uh, prophesy upon these bones, and you will say to them, dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. The word of Yahweh and the Ruach are closely connected in this text. The Devar Yahweh and the Ruach do things that make alive. And it gets better. Thankfully, here things start repeating. Koamar Adonai Yahweh, that's a messenger formula, setting us up for a solemn declaration. So Koamar Adonai Yahweh, and thus says the Lord Yahweh, La'atzamot ha'ela to these bones. Now, oh, things get cool here. Yes, this is awesome. Look at the vivid language. Hene, attention-getting particle. Ani, uh, your pronoun. Maybe. That's a hifil participle. A hifil participle of bow. And then with the uh, preposition afterwards. Uh, this combination here of, uh, of hene, ani, plus bo is a way Hebrew does to describe imminent action. Behold, I am about to bring upon them a spirit, and, they, and you will live. A note, oh, look at what word we see here. It's ruach again. It's spirit again. Nothing said so far about the condition of the bones. It's all about Devar Yahweh and Ruach bringing about this new reality. And note, it's hard, you cannot stress enough the vividness of how this is going to happen. The good news is it gets better. But Atati, Elekem, Gedim, and now we get all this good anatomy language that none of us necessarily know. And I will give upon them sinews. And I will cause to go upon them flesh. 
and I will care them and note all the verbs here. Here we have a here we have a hifu of Allah with the hay, with the patak being attracted by the uh, wild and crazy guttural. Otherwise, here was just some boring old cows. And skin will cover upon you, and I will give upon you a ruach. Ooh, ruach, I think, if I'm keeping score correctly, that's the third time we've seen it. And you will live. And now here is a key pivotal statement. Uh, get excited here. The get excited because now we get the whole purpose of what's going on. And you will know that I am Yahweh. Why does God save? God saves because God saves. And the result of this, and why does God save? In order that you may know that, Adon, that Ani Yahweh, that I am Yahweh. At this point, we get some wonderful repetition. But this is the purpose. Why does God save? Because that's what God does. Because Ani Yahweh. And, oh, Yahweh, to give you a quick refresher, that's the covenantal name. When I see Yahweh, I'm typically expecting to be thinking covenant language, salvific language, when I see the name Yahweh, as opposed to Elohim, which is just your big God, king of the universe. Uh, that said, now we go to the very bottom of the board, and everything repeats. And I prophesied, just a niffle of Navath. That's your uh, assimilated nun right here. Ka'ashir, as I commanded, as I was commanded. Note here, we got a little wild and crazy kibbutz here. Uh, verb form, we don't see all that often. That's a pool, the kibbutz and the doubling. Told you it's a pool, it's on your dubbelstam. Uh, as I was commanded. And a voice happened as I was prophesying. Note here, you have the calf, that's your preposition. Uh, once again, triangle of recognition points, that's your nifal, with the hay, with the hay prefix, that's your hifil infinitive construct, with the object suffix, so as I prophesied, and hene, and behold an earthquake, Sinaitic language, the uh, theophanic language here, and they drew near, etzem, etzemot, etzem, a, etzemo, uh, the repetition here, you, Hebrew could have been more efficient, but chose not to be. And it's this, you can almost hear the rattling sound of every bone coming together at this great assembly, this really bizarre sight. And this repetition really gives us the greater feel. The good news is, one, I have to scroll down because this text is lengthy. Okay, that's not necessarily the good news. But the good news is, now we finally get to the point in which, in which we can start seeing results. Uh, verse 8. And I saw Vahane. Again, another attention-getting particle. This is a crazy, vivid passage. And behold, sinews are upon them, and flesh went up, and skin covered upon them. And, and, from, and again, from upon them. And a spirit, there was no in them. This is your from above, by the way. That's Min, Lamed, and a whole lot of other stuff going on. But a spirit, there was not in them. Uh, the details here are very creation-oriented. We are now back to the creation of humanity in an ordered fashion. And we're still awaiting the breath. We're still awaiting the, the spirit. Vaomer Eli, and he said to me, and now, now we get to the meat, the heart of the matter. Hineve, prophesy to, oh, Ruach again, and I've lost count. Prophesy in the spirit. Hineva, you're getting your uh, nifal imperatives of Neva practice today, which you frankly won't see really much after this. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the spirit, Koamar Adonai Yahweh, another messenger formula. We already saw this earlier. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, from the four winds, Ruach here, 
Uh, come, Spirit, and breathe upon these, and now we, this word here is somewhat helpful. This is harag. Uh, uh, you know, it's a cow, cow has a participle with the shurik there. Uh, this is your, harag is your battle dead. So upon these battle slain, these corpses, and they will live. And now we finally are awaiting this resurrection and this restoration. And we almost reached the home stretch of this fairly lengthy text. And now verse 10. And I prophesied as he commanded. There's your just appeal of Sabah. And a spirit came on them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, strong, great, very mighty. Ma'od, ma'od. A great, mighty strength. And now finally we reach the end, sort of. And he said to me, Son of man, uh, these bones are all the house of Israel. They are, Hema. And behold, they are saying, Our bones are dry, and we've perished, and, and, and our hope, Tikva, is lost for us. And this really helps us see this, at least at one level, operating in the exilic perspective of the community that's lost that they said that God promised to be there and God isn't there. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I am opening your graves, and I am bringing about from your graves my people, and I will bring you to the land of Israel. If you're thinking about how, how to read this, note that this really is communal in nature at this point. Uh, what's going on is that we have this emphasis here that God restores a community. And because of that, oh, let's finish up the text and we'll take a couple moments to look at some implications. And you will know, oh, here, purpose clause, we already saw this again. Ani Yahweh, that I am Yahweh when I open up your tombs and when I bring upon you from your graves my people. And I will give a spirit upon you. The spirit brings life. Hence why this is the text assigned for Pentecost. No, we've gone from word to a whole lot of ruach, and frankly, by this point in our discussion, I've lost track. Hopefully, you're keeping a better tally at home than I am. But my spirit is in you. Spirit is connected with Haya, and you will live. And I will bring you upon your land, and you will know that I am Yahweh your God. I have spoken, I will do this, Naum Adonai, your utterance of Yahweh. So that's the gist of the Hebrew. Now the question becomes, where to go with this? A note, the Ruach image really gives you a lot to work with, especially thinking Pentecost. And how the spirit here plays a constant role of bringing life. Also this idea of creation and new creation, the Genesis implications as well. Another key area to explore is that we have echoes of this once Good Friday happens. For example, Matthew 27, when the graves are open, which shows that this Ezekiel vision of God's restoration has happened when the graves of the people are opened, when Jesus dies on the cross. As far as what to do with this in terms of that initial question I raised at the start of our time together today, is this national or is this re resurrection of the dead? And the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, you can call me a wimp that I'm going to take both options. That at least initially here in Ezekiel, this is a post-exilic restoration, which functions as a type of bodily resurrection of the resurrection of the dead. One of the things we just have to own up with with the Old Testament is that in terms of resurrection of the dead language, uh, we don't have a lot of explicit stuff to work with. Isaiah 25, Isaiah 26, Daniel 12 being basically your texts. 
So here we have this glorious pattern of resurrection, restoration of the community, the start of the church by the Spirit, but also the resurrection of the dead of the life of the world to come. It is good to have those dark days of no Old Testament reading over as we can again explore these riches. Uh, I really pray that you have fun with this text. There's so much going on. Ruach, Ruach everywhere. And may God's Ruach, may God's Spirit bless you as you prepare for your preaching for this text.